If you think gender-affirming care is a waste of a million dollars, wait till you find out what billionaires are doing with their money. Jeff Bezos has a $500 million property portfolio. That is 500 times the waste of money. Do you think Jeff Bezos needs a $500 million property portfolio? I don't. This necklace is $200 million. And do you know how they get diamonds for necklaces like this? They use dangerous slave labor practices and result in people like them dying. And remember how I mentioned that Jeffrey Bezos also has a $500 million property? Well, he's also one of the top 40s wealthiest yacht owners. Millions of dollars! on fucking boats that they use once or twice a year. And all of that is brought to you by the working class's taxpayer cuts. If you think a million dollars going to people's gender affirming care is a waste of money, then I think it's safe to say that trans people aren't the ones detached from reality. I think it might be you. And I'd like to remind you that the only reason we even have to get together to raise money for other people is because while 99% of humanity's income is falling, the top 10 richest people in the world are still getting richer. Working class wages are stagnant, while the pricing of food and housing is being controlled by the ultra-wealthy. And I'd be willing to wager that that is really a waste of millions, billions, and even trillions of dollars. How did you get past security? His fortress is impenetrable. Door was unlocked. Son of a bitch! There are not nearly enough therapists right now that are concerned about the state of the world. Because the reality is that we are living within a liberal mental health system, which is really designed to appease the masses and use mental health as a way to distance ourselves from the current structural, historical, and political climate. And what this neoliberal mental health framework does is it, when it focuses on the individual and away from the systems at play, what it also does is it pacifies rage and anger as illegitimate responses to the current violent to the current violence and harms that we are witnessing. And it also pathologizes resistance and it creates this idea that like your involvement in resisting these systems at play is disturbing your peace and we know that fascism loves peace and that this version of peace is about maintaining the status quo and upholding the interests of the ruling class and that depoliticizing trauma mental health therapy creates an echo chamber of chronic validation for people's right to comfort and so the therapists and people who are in mental health who have decided that they're not going to take a stance around Palestine, maybe even take it a step further, actually align with the oppressor and with the colonizer, are only concerned with your own independent individual healing journey and as a result creating a rift and a huge disconnect between our own personal liberation and our collective liberation. But those two things go hand in hand and cannot be disconnected from one another. Embedding neoliberalism and hyper individualism within a mental health framework for the masses is actually creating and normalizing a society that is going to become more isolated and actually push us to become more complacent within our own oppression because what happens is we are on a hamster wheel of constantly being on this so-called healing journey without changing the actual material conditions that are hurting and harming so many people and leading us into a huge mental health crisis and collapse. Because what we know about trauma is that connection and interdependence is what actually facilitates healing. But we know that that is not possible without collective resistance and collective action towards dismantling these systems and building something that is better. And that has to start with addressing people's material conditions. You cannot be pro-black and anti-ghetto black people, bro. I remember when I first got into activism, I was dealing with the sisters who had the froze and the girls who wore the head wraps and the big wooden jewelry and the brother Hanifs and the brother Hakeems. And I was trying to do my own thing, right? But I was the type of girl who wore wigs. And sometimes the wigs were outrageous colors. And so they would tell me things like, you know, maybe people won't take you seriously because you're wearing a wig, but preaching pro-black right? And it was in that moment that I realized if you're not riding 
for the girl who's rocking the pink and blue 30 inch bust down with the middle part okay walking down the street with the bonnet on the top of that middle part then you're not writing for none of us because you're acting like a black person is supposed to be subjected to acting a specific kind of way and black people are not a monolith what are you afraid of not following the rules Whole lot of uproar going on in the timeline around right now about black people saying that they scared of hood black people or ghetto black people. I'm gonna start off with a mouthful. Toni Morrison says that American immigrants have to ingest and participate in anti-blackness as a prerequisite for assimilation. And I think that statement remains true for people who aren't even immigrants, for American black people. People gotta understand that we live in a white supremacist matrix. Let me break that down. All our engineers, the people who have paved the roads, the people who have made the um, the architects who are designing these skyscrapers, the people, they're white. They're white. And don't you believe, I feel like we all can consciously admit that when you physically and tangibly manifest something, create something physically, it is an extension of you. It is a manifestation of your ideology. If all this shit has been built by white people, this is a white supremacist matrix. And ghetto black people are the people who have been denied complete access. And quite honestly, they're the people who don't give a fuck to have access to this white supremacist matrix. So these suburban people saying that, oh, I'm scared of black people. I'm scared of da 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 Of course you are. It's a prerequisite for assimilation. Of course. We can say there's a time and place for everything, but who has established this time and place? White supremacy. It's a white supremacist matrix. So niggas being niggas is always going to make people uncomfortable. We are naturally loud and obnoxious. So sorry. You go to school, niggas is yelling and ready to fight in the morning so sorry they do not care to abide by the rules that they themselves did not create some of us can call that radical some of us call that ghetto hey it depends on which lens you're looking through i'm not looking through a white supremacist one you get what i'm saying so i don't know i feel like i can never condemn a black person for acting any fucking way that they want to because the shit is not made for us period so do what the fuck you want to do if you want to go downtown and loot do what you want to do. Like, what? <laughs> the same way we could say you can't be anti-black and you can't be pro-black and transphobic, pro-black and, homo and homo homosexual. Yes, you can. Pro-black and homophobic. You cannot be pro-black and anti-ghetto black people, bro. It's impossible. It is impossible. You cannot do that, bro. <laughs> Pro-blackness is not stepping into white respectability politics. And that's what people got to realize, bro. Martin Luther King and all them niggas putting on tuxes to go march and get and get holes down. They did what they had to do, but they was playing into white respectability politics. They was in the era where they had to prove I am human. Look at me, please. I put on a suit to go to work too, please. We passed that, bro. Let the ghetto black people just live, bro. They don't care about that shit. Nobody's pandering no more. And I think that's what be upsetting for some people. You see black people actively not pandering, not putting their best fit on, not walking outside without their bonnet on, not following these made up ass rules. That's not their game to play. That's your game to play. Misrespectability. So that's my take on it. Um, if you don't like criminals, then just don't like criminals. But if we talking about ghetto hood black people, let's hush on that one. Amen. When they dig up your bones, they'll know you were trans. Okay, I'll be dead. No. No, we can't. Hi, guys. I'm an anthropologist, an archaeologist, and I have excavated, studied, and taught all about human remains. So let's start at the beginning. When we're looking at human remains, we look at certain skeletal features. 
Oh, my 3D printer is going in the background, but we're going to get through this anyway. All right, so on the over here we have a um, a male skull, and over here we have a female skull. They look really different, but you have to realize these are extremes of the two types. We do look for certain skeletal markers. We look at, oh, we can see over here the area where the nose is or the back of the skull. But this is a spectrum. And I usually grade it from one to five, one being the least robust or the most gracile, and five being the most robust or the most, yeah, or the most robust. We do the same thing with pelvises where the male tends to be shorter and more narrow and the female tends to be, um, excuse me, the male tends to be uh, more narrow and longer and the female tends to be wider and shorter. However, once again, this is on a spectrum. In reality, we almost never see these extremes. This would be the sort of thing I would give to my students where I would say, look at the differences and they can easily see the differences because I get one, I take one skull that is very robust and I take one skull that's very gracile and then they'll do the whole thing. Same thing with pelvises. The problem is, from our point of view, is that we almost never see that. For one thing, we might not get all the bones or they might be fragmentary. Secondly, you almost never see those extremes. You see something in the middle. You see, instead of having fives or ones on the scale, you see threes. And when you have a bunch of threes, you can't really tell if that is um, somebody that was biologically or born male or biologically or born female. And then it gets even tougher because those skeletal markers are determined by your hormones, and those hormones have a whole bunch of both environmental as well as genetic components. It's not just as simple as saying somebody is XY or XX. And then when we get to the, the chromosomes, well, that's on a spectrum too. Everybody isn't born either XX or XY. We have about five to seven common um, chromosomal differences between people. So XX, XY, XXY, XYY, XO, um, it goes on. All right. Remember, we are all physically female in the womb. It isn't until the last trimester where hormones really start going, um, getting together, that our secondary sexual characteristics or depending on how you want to say it, the primary ones, uh, start to differentiate. That's when those little things where, you know, boys have little peepees and girls don't, that's where it comes from. But before that, you can't tell the difference. All right. And I'm not even getting into individuals that are intersexed or anything like that. Plus, when you're looking at variation between ancestral populations, there is a huge difference. For example, Native American skeletal remains tend to be more robust overall than, say, uh, those populations that come from uh, East Asia or Southeast Asia. Um, those tend to be more gracile. Uh, same thing going with European populations. You have some populations that are more robust, some that are more gracile. So that messes things up because those are the only things we're looking at. Then you have, how are these skeletal markers made? Well, a lot of these skeletal markers that we look at have to do with muscle attachments. They get larger with the more load you put on them. So classically, we'd say men are stronger than women. Men do all the outdoor worky stuff. They're doing the farming and the fighting and all of that. So they have larger muscles, so they have larger muscle attachments. This isn't always true. So... If I came down and you gave me even a complete skeleton, I would be able to tell you this person was probably born male or probably born female. I wouldn't know what 
if they were XX, XY, or something else, I wouldn't know if they're intersexed, and I wouldn't be able to tell you with 100% certainty. I'd be maybe at the 75 to 85% certainty. Um, but that's it. There's always about 15% of the skeletal remains, even with complete skeletal remains, that we cannot say for sure one way or another whether they would be male or female. Lastly, I want to say that if you've been paying attention, I have said male or female. Those are the scientific terms that we use. I have not said man or woman. Man or woman has to do with gender, and gender has nothing whatsoever to do with your skeleton. So there you go. Peace out, guys. Honest question, genuine question, why don't leftists care about masking? Why aren't supposed radical, socially conscious people, why aren't they masking? Like, we're in a full-on pandemic raging, disabling hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions. We care about liberation, but not for the disabled. I, I just, I don't, I genuinely do not understand the dissonance. We claim to care about communal safety, but like not about community when it comes to a virus that's spreading and acts like HIV in a lot of ways. COVID, it's a damaging virus. It's truly a damaging virus. And the denial and the passivity of leftist people in masking, I just, I, I can't, I can't grasp it, man. Our government has lied to us about everything, but they haven't withheld things about COVID. Like COVID's the thing that we can trust them on. I'm at a loss. I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm just, I just don't get it.